why we need to go in beyond traditional aids and concessional loans. And uh, I'll provide a theoretical you know, rationale for that. And I'll talk about new sources for financial development. You know, for structural transformation in the developing world. Uh, you know, no poverty, no poverty is the number one goal in SDGs. And the way to achieve that is to create jobs. And that's goal number eight. For the able people and to create and to increase their labor productivity through technological innovation, industrial upgrading, diversification, and infrastructure improvement. That's SDG line. And a developing country have the late commerce advantages in technological innovation, industrial upgrading. And so potentially, they should be able to grow faster than high income country and uh, become, become prosperous and achieve, converge it to the high income country, certainly poverty will be eliminated. However, many developed countries have been trapped in low income status and uh, in our poverty is still one of the major challenges in the world, in spite of their own effort and of multilateral development institutions support. And we know that investment is essential for technological innovation, industrial upgrading, and infrastructural improvement. And we know after the Second World War, many multilateral and bilateral institu development institutions were set up to provide development aids and a concession loan to the developing country. And theoretically, this kind of aids and loans can expand the capital base and allow them to make more investment for technology innovation, industrial creating infrastructure investment, then they should be able to you know, grow faster and become prosperous. However, most developing countries have been trapped in poverty, low income status. And so it's essential for us to have a little bit of rethinking why development assistance you know, are not successful. And uh, do we have a new way to improve the development assistance? And uh, I think the idea is the most important. And you know, from what I see, the reason why, in spite of the indi you know, individual national effort and uh, global support, the developing country did not succeed in you know, reducing poverty and so on. It's because they are guided by wrong ideas. And you know, the development ideas, development economics was a new subdiscipline. It did not come into exist only after the Second World War. And we know that the first addition of development economics is structuralism, try to advise the developing country to you know, industrialize in order to catch up the high income country. And they argue that the government should play an active role to mobilize resources and to support the modern industries, but they failed. And then in the 1980s, 1990s, the idea changed to neoliberalism. I think the reason why the developing country did not perform well was because of the market fail, uh, government values and uh, advised the country to you know, have privatization, marketization, stabilization in order to allow market to function. Again, the country followed this approach. Their economy also performed poorly. And during this period of time, there were a few successful developing economies. And you find their policy framework basically was considered as wrong policies from the mainstream ideas. For example, in the 1950s, 1960s, the idea was to develop you know, modern industries, but there are few successful East Asian economies they started with not on, not import substitution, but they further export promotion, not a developed large scale industry. They started a traditional small scale labor intensive industry. And in the 1980, 1990, during the transition period, China, Vietnam, Cambodia did quite well, but they did not follow the Washington consensus. They started with some kind of gradual dual track you know, approach. And again, at that time, those kind of gradual dual track transition was considered as the worst possible approach from the neoliberalism, but they were successful. So that's the reason why I think that we need to rethink the you know, idea which guide our policy effort. 
And the idea that I'd like to promote is a new edition of development economics, which I call new structural economics. And uh, it's an application of modern, you know, neoclassic approach to study the determinants and the impact of structure and structural evolution in the process of economic development. By convention, I should call this as structural economics, but to distinguish from the structuralism, I call new structural economics. The main idea is that economic structure, including technology, industry, institution, and so on, are endogenous. Endogenous to the endowment and its structure. Endowment, I mean labor, natural resources, and capital that are available in any country at any time. And why endowments and its structure are so important? Because endowments is the total budget of a country at any specific time, and it has a structure. If you are abundant in labor force, labor wage will be low. If you are abundant in capital, capital will be relatively inexpensive. And this kind of relative prices will determine the competitive advantage of an economy at any specific time. And if you develop your technology and industry according to your comparative advantages, then the factor cost of production will be the lowest. And this will should be considered the best industrial structure you have. And uh, uh, so for me, the best industrial structure and technology structure is also endogenous. But for us, certainly, the development want to raise the income. How to raise the income? Certainly, you need to move from you know, low value added manufacturing, that's labor intensive, to higher value added you know, manufacturing, and so on. But as industrial structure is endogenous, if you want to move up the industrial scale, you know, the latest, you need to accumulate capitals. And, and if you accumulate capitals, you change your endowment structure, then you will have an industrial upgrade. In this process, you also need to improve infrastructure because when you move to more capital intensive industry, they rely on power, they need to have a larger market network and so on. So you also need to improve the infrastructure in order to reduce transaction cost and make the industry you have competitive advantage into very competitive in international and domestic economy. And when you say a country was trapped in low income status or middle income status, that means this country do not have this kind of dynamic structure transformation. <coughs> but what would be the best way to kickstart this kind of dynamic process when we know that the structure is endogenous to endowments? And my argument is that to develop your economy according to your competitive advantage at any, any time determined by your endowments. Because if you do that, and especially with, you know, you know, adequate infrastructure, you can turn competitive advantages into competitiveness, and then you can have a larger market, you can create profit, you can accumulate capitals, and I can prove. If you follow this approach, capital accumulation will be fastest, and it will provide a foundation for the industrial upgrading, for the job creation, for the poverty reduction. And to develop an economy according to your comparative advantage is a term only understandable to Economists, for entrepreneur, they like to have profit. And how to make the spontaneous choice of entrepreneur become to be consistent with your compared advantage, we need to have one institution. That is competitive market. So you can have a relative prices which can reflect relative abundance of factor endowments. In my case, so important, can government also name it? Yes, government is also named. Because in the process of industrial grading, technological innovation, industrial diversification, you need to you know, solve the issue of coordination. You also need to improve the infrastructure institutions. And those are, you know, will have the market values. And so you also need to have a facilitation state. And if development assistance is used to support this kind of structure transformation, you know, to support this kind of structures and transformation to expand the capital base for a facilitated state to overcome kind the of binding constraint, then the development system will be very effective. And uh, from this, we understand how come the structuralism, which was so popular in 1950s, 60s, failed, because they target run sectors. They target the capital intensive of run sectors, which the country did not have compared advantages. And as a result, the firm that in this kind of private sectors were not viable, and the government would have to you know, create all kinds of distortion to support them. And as a result, you know, those kind of sectors become white elephant, and uh, the economic performance was poor. From this, we also understand how come Washington consensus did not work. Because Washington consensus did not 
recognize that the distortions were endogenous to the need of protect those kind of sectors in the order priorities. And if you remove all the distortion through the shock therapy and the advised by Washington consensus, those kind of people will go bankrupt, create a huge number of unemployment, and then you are not going to have social political stabilities. Not only so, some of those kind of firm in these older sectors, very captain initiative, they are also related to national defense. And if you allow them to go bankrupt, like in you know, Ukraine, then you are not going to have any ability to protect yourself. And, 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 and that's one reason why the Washington consensus did not work. And also Washington consensus go against the government to have some kind of facilitation role for specific sectors in the structures transformation. And so that's the reason why many countries face the issue of denaturalization because their industry went back up, but the industry would not emerge. And this also explains how come, and, and at that time, in the 1980s, 1990s, most of the development aids were used to do support the structural adjustment, to support this kind of structural transformation to rule the government you know, interventions, but they did not play the role to facilitate structural transformation. And after the 1990s, because of values of this, you know, structural adjustment law. International development assistance, including the multilateral and the bilateral, changed to humanitarian aids, for example, education, health, gender, governance, and so on. But those are not related directly to support the structural transformation. And that's the reason why we see the industrialization, we see the public is still a big issue. And then how come China, Vietnam, and a few you know, transition economies, they can be successful by the dual track? Because the dual track, on the one hand, they provide consist, they co continuous support to the old sector to maintain stability, and they play active role to facilitate the growth of the new sector to the structural transformation and so on. And so they can achieve competitiveness and dynamic economic growth, and they can also benefit from the late companies advantages. And the new sectors, when they grow very rapid, they accumulate capital, then you are going to have a natural grading. In the natural grading, they can benefit from the late commercial advantages and uh, the government play facilitation role for the industrial grading, and so they can you know, grow dynamically. So this strategy, transition strategy, in the 1980s and 1990s seemed to be a consensus among the international academics community to be the worst possible approach now turn out to be the best approach. And uh, with this kind of new framework, now we know if you want to make a different development assistance to be successful in terms of structural transformation, job creation, poverty reduction, you need to expand the capital base for the government to support the structural transformation in terms of providing infrastructure, in terms of you know, facilitation and natural grading, those kind of things. And in coming to now, if we look in the futures, in the past, the savings in the high income country, advanced country, and also in the developing country, before 2000 was about the same. Both country, both was about 25% of their GDP. But after the 2000, the developing country saving increased a lot. You know, and uh, developed countries, you know, saving declined substantially. And especially we, include China, then the contribution of saving from the developing country by the time of 2010 already reached more than 50%. And the developed country, their contribution you know, dropped down to about 15%. So that means there will be more funding for supporting development from the emerging country, from the developing world. And if you look into the global investment, you know, before 2000, about 80% of the investment in the world came from high-income countries. But after 2000, the situation changes. By the time of 2010, the developed country contribute about 50% of global investment, and developing country, you know, including China, also contribute about 50%. But if you include China, the developing country also contribute about 27, 28%. But looking in the future, 
by the time of 2020, 2030, most likely developed developed country, advanced country, will only have about 20% of the investment in the world. But the developing country, you know, if you exclude China, they will contribute to about 45%. And if you include China, they will contribute to about 80%. So that means looking in the future, more funds will be coming from the developing country. I think the projection is very uh, consistent with Richard's you know, findings. And especially China. China currently is the second largest economy in the world. China is the largest trading country in the world. And most likely by, China, by the time of 20, you know, 25, China will be a high income country. And certainly China needs to contribute more to the global you know, development assistance. And uh, China announced a lot of programs like Bear and Road Initiative, like AIIB, and China also pledged to give more funding in the UN 2015 you know, uh, 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 meetings and, uh, and so on, and especially in the FOCA meeting. That in 2015, China pledged to provide 60 billion US dollars in three years. And in just a few days ago, China pledged to give another 50 billion to the development assistance. But there's something different. The emerging Donors, they provide funding to promote something different. In the past, mostly in the you know, development and a grant or concession alone. But for the emerging donors, including China and so on, you know, more of the fund will be coming from the official, uh, other official flow, in addition to the grant and the concession <coughs> alone, where official like loans or official, you know, like investment, those kind of things. So that related to more of the loan and the investment, but they are targeting for the structure transformation. So that compare conventional North-South development aids that by, you know, back and so on, they are based on development experience in a developed country. You know, what developing developed countries think are important, then they use those kind of funds in concessional loan or aids to support those kind of activity. And, and, but they are untied to the trade, untied to their structural transformation. But if you look in the South-South cooperation, including from China, India, or Turkey, and so on, they are more coming to you know, trade or investment in infrastructure in industries. And certainly they're also based on their own experience about what is important. And uh, we are facilitating more to support the developing country to utilize their comparative advantages. So that should be more available to you know, structure transformation, job creation, and to utilize the possibility of you know, trade as well as like comments advantages. And so let me conclude. I you know, published a book uh, 2017 on this. And uh, the conclusion is that development assistance will be helpful for development if they are used for expanding the government resources for facilitation structural transformations. And uh, because of conventional development aids and concessional borrowings to the poor, you know, has a, had a poor development result because they are not really targeting directly to help the country to have a successful structural transformation. And uh, so we need to go to, you know, new idea. And also, we also need, need to tap into the new resources. And uh, luckily, the new resources are more likely to, you know, to use for support structural transformation. And, uh, but to make that, we need to expand the definition. And uh, as long as any kind of fund can be used to facilitate the structure transformation in an uh, inclusive and a sustainable way, those kind of things will help us to achieve the goal that's set up for the international development communities. So if we follow the new ideas, maybe we have a chance to achieve the SDG by the time of 2030. Thank you.